you know, my veil was not able to keep you safe today because my veil is not strong enough to keep you safe. But look at her. She is your mother and my mother. And she loves us so much that no matter what, she will hide us under her mantle. So I was too filled with that pride and the vain glory of this world. I wanted degree after degree. I was never satisfied with something little. That the train I was supposed to be on, the metropolitan train that blasted in out it. That bus I was supposed to drive today. But today, God saved me because you were supposed to come here. My name is Father Gladstone Francesco Dabre. I'm an Augustinian priest. I'm currently based in uh, Clare Priory in England, uh, which is not too far from Cambridge city. I'm a friar as well as I'm a priest um, of uh, the Order of St. Augustine. Order of St. Augustine, which was formed as a union in 1244 and then uh, reunited again in 1256 by the wish of the Holy Fathers at the time. Every saint has a past and every sinner has a future, as somebody has said. And it's very interesting how we see in the lives of our saints. You know, a lot of times the way their lives are returned and they are modeled, it feels like as if they were born saints. But they also lived just like us. They also struggled like us because they were not spared from temptation, sin, brokenness, woundedness, the traumas of their life but how they were able to overcome with the power and love of God, how they were able to hold the hand of the Lord and not let him go. I was born in India. Uh, in a small little town uh, called Vasai, in a village of Bhuigao. And today I would say it's like a big city, um, you know, and it was thousands of miles away from here where I was born. I was born in a very devout Catholic family. My family always went to church. We prayed together, we did our rosaries together. We did our all Catholic practices. We went for pilgrimages together. It was a small little tiny family, but family that was where I found the initial nurturing and love for God. It came specially from my grandmother because both my parents were working most of the time uh, because we have a big farm and my father worked always in his uh, professional job. And therefore, my parents were always busy working, but I was raised by my maternal grandmother who always constantly went to church. And it was her faith that she handed on to me. And she took me to church every day. Whether it was rain or it was sun or it was cold, I always went to church. In my home village, the mass is still conducted at, celebrated at 6.30 in the morning. And my grandmother would wake me up quite early in the morning and get me ready and she would take me to church every single day. My grandmother, when she would take me to church, one morning she was taking me to the church. It was called cold and windy and it was raining. My grandmother at the time, because of the widows of the time, used to wear a long veil over their hair, head and when they would go to church. I just didn't know what was the whole significance of it. It was like the veil that you would see on the statues of Mother Mary, a long white veil, and it would go till, uh, till their feet. And, my, and I was wearing shorts and flip-flops as I was going to church. I was only six years old. And I was shivering because of all that cold. I guess my grandmother didn't realize what the weather would be as we were going to the church. And so she covered me under that particular veil or that mantle, and she took me to the church. When we arrived in the church, she took me to the shrine of Our Lady of Mother of Perpetual Help. 
as she always would do she lit her candle but that particular day she looked down and she said to me son you know my veil was not able to keep you safe today because my veil is not strong enough to keep you safe but look at her she is your mother and my mother and she loves us so much that no matter what she will hide us under her mantle she would always keep us safe and she said son in life when things become difficult always come to her because she will hide you and keep you safe those words that my grandmother said even as i speak today are still strong in my heart in my mind and they remain with me but i must say as i left home at the age of 18 to go to the college and university i got into completely wrong crowd i guess that had begun the 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 seeds of it had already been there because i was already in the wrong crowd as i was growing up i was more interested on the world and its spirit its power and all the pleasure and leisure that it provided to me i fell in love many many times as my father augustine would say that he was so much empowered and taken up by this desire for lust and the spirit of lust that that was grappling him the desire to be something great so i was too filled with that pride and the vain glory of this world i wanted degree after degree i was never satisfied with something little and i became so ambitious that i wanted the highest paying job highest this and this and and all the material stuff that i started to collect around myself after finishing my masters i got a job to be a social worker i traveled across to england now i was completely far away from my immediate family I fell in love and I was in love with this girl for many many years and I just thought it was going to work out I wanted to have a big family and I just thought that is it I had a big job I had a big life and I had a a person in my life that I was in love with but then suddenly something went sour in our relationship we suddenly get got into arguments obviously she was trying to protect me that i wouldn't go down the route i was taking and she was trying to bring me back because she was very uh, very catholic and she was going to church and she just didn't understand why on earth the man that she knew who was a catholic man was completely a christian man who was going completely down the route of destruction we had a massive argument and then she suddenly disappeared from my life only to appear 6 months later to say Hey, I'm in love with somebody else. I'm going to marry that man. It broke my heart. And then I went into the cycle of relationships after relationships after relationships. Ultimately, I met somebody else. But then once again there we because of the woundedness, the hurt and the brokenness was so much that I just could not get into the relationships of trust, of love, of that friendship, of that understanding because I was so broken. in my life and that brokenness could not accept the love of somebody else and this poor girl i broke her heart on valentine's day i went to see her in a restaurant that i had booked i went and i saw her she was already there and i said to her after the first drink listen it's not going to work i think we should end it here and i looked into her eyes and i could see she was in tears and she said you know gladson i knew it was not going to work out thank you for being honest with me and those words stayed with me thank you for being honest with me because i always thought i was a dishonest man selfish man who always thought about himself because my life was all about i me myself in a way never gazing and licking my own wounds and living my own poor me situation some of you would know that there was a london bombing 77 where the trains and the buses were bombed in london it was such a terrible day i was supposed to go and visit a family that was looking after our children who were in their care and we were supposed to go for a court hearing together and as i was going to the metropolitan train 
that eventually blasted in Algate. I was about to step foot and I tried to get into the tube, but the driver, the guard would not open the door. And so I came out. I was furious, I was angry because I was getting late and I was just so not happy. I came to the bus stop because now I had to take a longer route to get to the family where I was and I knew I was running late. And as I got into the bus, I knew the atmosphere in the bus was not the same as it would have been in the past. Everybody was so quiet, so somber, and I just didn't know what had happened. I could see the fear in the eyes of the people. And I thought maybe because I was in the depth of the darkness, in pain of my own life, I thought that's what I was seeing around me. That I was not able to see the light, but I was only seeing this fear and darkness around me. And so somehow I made my way to this family. And this was an African family from Sierra Leone. And I rang the doorbell and my foster carer, she opened the door and she just picked me up, put me in the air, put me down. And I was like, that's so inappropriate. You don't do that to your social worker. And she said to me, how did you get here, Mr. Gladson? And I said, I came by bus because I could not get into the train and I was running late and she said and she dragged me through her hallway into her sitting room and she said look at the television and that was a moment she showed me that the train I was supposed to be on the metropolitan train that blasted in Algate and then she said to me wait for the next clip and she said see that bus because she was a bus driver as well along with being a foster carer and she said that bus I was supposed to drive today but today God saved me because you were supposed to come here and you were saved because you did not get on the train in my case I could see how happy she was her family was her children were because obviously the life was saved today and they were thanking me and God for organizing that meeting and they said what a beautiful coincidence Today as a priest, I don't believe in coincidences. I believe in God incidences. Today when I look back all those years ago, I believe that was a God incidence. I had applied for the job and I was so looking forward to it because as you know, I said I was ambitious. I was so prideful. I had reached the height of the job in the place where I was. And now I needed to jump up because I wanted to eventually land up in United Nations. Now, don't know why I wanted to join the United Nations because I was so desperate to get there and achieve that level so that I could work in child at convention. But then that particular job did not happen. That job was given to my colleague who had the similar degrees, similar situation like me. The only difference was she was a woman and she was given the job. My heart broke. I sank into even depth of bitterness. I was so angry and furious but because I was at work when I got this news I could not do anything. I just went into the side of our office where there was a fire exit. It was a place where nobody ever went. It was a place in the darkness. I sat there in the darkness, sat on the steps and I cried at the top of my voice and I said why God why are you doing this to me? And to my surprise and today I stand on this holy ground and I say how on earth that I had missed his promptings all along the way and there I was and I heard those words interlocution inside me wherein God spoke with me and he said these words it is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in man it is better to trust in the Lord than to trust in princes it was from Psalm 118 and I just didn't know where those words came from. I suddenly had this powerful peace over my life, powerful joy. I was crying my eyes out. My eyes were bloodshot red. I was completely as if I had broken. And, and there I was completely joyful, completely smiling. I came out of that place. I went to my dear colleague, a dear sister of mine, Priscilla. And I said to her, Priscilla, you wouldn't believe what has happened. She looked at me and she thought probably I had taken something or I had smoked something and she said, are you okay? You look very high. And I said, I'm very high. But this high is something different that I ever had. And I want to tell you the first good news and you are the first person I want to say, I'm going to write a book. 
and she definitely thought by this time I was already <laughs> taking something, some form of a drug that made me go high. And she said, tell me more. And I could see she was sitting like this, tell me more. And I said to her, I'm going to write a book. It is better to trust in the Lord. And I could see her eyes were wide open, her jaws dropped, and she said to me, what? You writing a book on it is better to trust in the Lord? You, Gladson, what is happening to you? You don't even go to church. You don't even want to know the Lord. And I said to her, these are the words that came to me. And she said to me, really? And you think they came from you? And I said, yes, Priscilla, it came from me. And she said to me, no, Gladson, I have been telling you all along with my husband, Christy, that always remember God speaks to you. And I said, but I have never read the Bible. I don't know these words. And she said, and I said, I am a man, you know how I have come home at times completely drugged up, smoke and drunk and completely in, in darkness. How can God speak with, speak with me, the man who is so fill, full of filthiness, of shame, of that dirtiness? And she says, God speaks with you. And I said, no, no, no. These words came from me. And she said, first of all, you are a Catholic. Remember, she was Pentecostal. So she said, you are a Catholic. Second, you don't go to church. Third, you don't read the Bible. So how would you know? She went on the computer and she showed me where these words were. And I said to her, it is not possible. God cannot speak with me. And I started to pursue this. I went for a retreat in a monastery. And in this monastery, I was there for two weeks. And I was sick most of the time because it felt like I was going through withdrawal of the world because I was not able to use my mobile. I was not able to use my screen. I was not able to, you know, talk to people because there was, there was no mobile network. I was completely in this place. I was literally climbing the walls of the monastery. And I was like, somebody get me out of here. And there was the monks who were so gentle, so loving, and they were very kind with me. And as I remember, as I was leaving that place, the father abbot came to me and he said, Gladson, are you going to visit us again? And I said, Father, I'll try again because I had something interesting experience, even though I became crazy living this life. And he said, you're most welcome, you can come again. I go to this monastery, not to join this monastery, but I go to this monastery in order to seek my, my relationship with God, encounter God once again, because I just wanted to see Him, experience Him, find that love somehow I was missing. And I just wanted to know who this God is, even though I was raised in a, in a devout Catholic family. But somehow this particular experience of God speaking with me in the depth of my, my situations, I had not known before. And there I was in that monastery. And when I'm spending this second time in this monastery on a time of a retreat, I'm going for walks. I do rosary. I've learned to say rosary again. I go and do adoration with the monks. I join them for their morning office and divine uh, morning prayer and divine office. I got an opportunity to speak with the monks, explain my life, receive the sacraments and, and did my powerful confession, wherein God literally I felt being washed in His precious blood and set free. And there I am kind of a new creation. And during all these times as the monks, you know, in their silence and their day-to-day -day life, they were somehow praying for me, lifting me up, raising me up to say you are worthy because Jesus has made you worthy even though I never felt worthy. But Jesus has made you worthy. And so as I was leaving that place, Father Abbott once again came to me and he said, you know, Gladson, what is next? And I said, I'll go back to my work. I still want to pursue my career and see if I can get to United Nations and see what happens next. And then he said, and then what comes next? And I said, well, now I'll start going to church again. I will uh, live the holy life that God calls me because I've learned quite a lot from you all. And I'm going to seek somebody who can guide me. I'll go to church all the time. 
I'll do the sacraments. Somehow God has really brought that healing to me. And he said, and what next? And I said, well, uh, I'm sure I will find somebody now. I start going to church. So hopefully I'll meet a good Catholic girl and I will start getting into, uh, you know, finding a relationship and eventually get married. And then he said, what next? And I said, well, I'll have few children and I, my desire is I will adopt few more. And he said, what next? And I said, well, I'll grow old and die. And then he said, and what next? And I said, hopefully heaven. And he said, Bert Gladson, have you ever thought about becoming a priest? And I said, oh, Father, when I was a child, people always used to say, you will become a good priest. And I said, that time I was an altar server. I have a couple of uncles who are priests. I have an uncle who is a bishop. I have got a lot of aunties who are nuns. And I said, well, it was all exciting then. But I said, that excitement has gone. Now I really want to be the father of the family. And he said, well, what if God is calling you? And I said, well, God must be calling me, but I would like to have my children follow that path. And I promise you, I will raise them as good Catholics and Christians so that they can really live and experience the power of God. And I can tell you, Father, I will ensure that a couple of them at least go and become priests and a couple of them become nuns. And if they don't go, I'll put them by force in the monastery. And he said to me, Gladson, it's not worked on you. It's not going to work on them. But what if God is calling you? Think about it again. And as I journeyed, nearly taking two flights back to London, and I arrived in London, these words of that father, that priest kept on, um, you know, ringing in my ears. And I just thought, really, could God call me? And that childhood desire and dream somehow started to take seed. And that seed somehow started to flourish. A year later, I decided I'll take that step. I knew I did not want to be a diocesan priest because I did not want to live alone. Somehow I wanted to live in a community. Community life is something that you, it's like a wife you can't live with, you can't live without. And there it is. I lived, I, I decided that I would live in the community because community life is something that I, difficult as it could be, painful as it could be, but somehow I knew that would help me, nurture me, nourish me, to lead me on the path of holiness. I was ordained in 2018 in, on the 5th of May 2018 in St. Augustine Church in Hammersmith where on that day I could see God who had begun His good work despite of the fact that I went away from Him, He pursued me like the hound of heaven and somehow brought me back. And He brought me back to that day to experience the power of His love as His priest, as a friar, as an Augustinian, as a son of Augustine, but above all, the son of the heavenly father, the heavenly daddy who loves me and who has done everything for me because his son Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood for me so that I could experience the power of his healing. On that day of my solemn profession a year before and my ordination really brought home to me the reality of God's overpowering love. As an Augustinian today, I can see that encounter coming to life where God constantly speaks with me. And the words that He spoke with me all those years ago, He still continues to do with me. You know, and there are times I have a good smile when I'm somewhere and I'm just praising God. In, in the car that I drive, I always have praise and worship music and gospel tracks so that I'm constantly listening to the Lord. I'm constantly in the ways of the Lord. And somehow, gently He will say, Hey, we haven't spent time together. You haven't spoken with me for a while. I'm waiting for you, my friend. I wait for you. I long for you. And I am, I am in love with you. And that love is so powerful. Now, I could not rest until I find that restlessness, resting in Jesus alone, in God's heart alone. As an Augustinian and as Augustinian friars, that's what we do. We bring that our restlessness, our woundedness to God, in whom we find our rest, and then we can go out and bring that healing to others. 
And that's what we do in our ministry, our mission of preaching the good news, of bringing God's people to that love. So there is no judgment, there is no condemnation, there is no fear, but only love. And only love that can heal us. Lord and Savior, bless us with holy priests. Through their ministry, may your life-giving presence in the sacraments be always present in your church. Amen.